Hello everyone, my name is Chris and welcome to the Workers' Reading Room. Today I'll be reading Eight Pieces of Empire, A Twenty-Year Journey Through the Soviet Collapse, written in 2011 by Lawrence Scott Sheets. This is Part 1, Farewell Leningrad, Farewell Empire. In 1989, most Western Kremlinologists were still giddy with Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev and his reform package to cure the ills of the Soviet Union. Known as Glasnost and Perestroika, Openness and Restructuring, the program was designed to bring the evil empire in from the cold, as it were. The prevailing view among the Western Kremlin watchers was that the Soviet Union was not destined for total collapse, even after the end of that year, as communist regimes in Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, East Germany, Romania, Poland, and even Maoist Albania had either fallen or were teetering. This view of the USSR as reformable remained intact. It was not just Kremlinologists who got it wrong. The notion of the Soviet Union going belly up was incomprehensible to many Westerners. Empire is a seductive concept, reassuring, monolithic, predictable, and comforting. And we Americans, and they, the Soviets, had cuddled up to the idea for about seven decades. During school drills, we'd huddled in fallout shelters with the telltale nuclear symbol, imagining our foes engaging in the same predictable right. Waking up to find the Soviet Union gone was too mind-boggling to contemplate. If the society of our arch-enemy of the Cold War, the one we spent generations fearing, could collapse with such ease, what did that suggest about our own assumed immortality? Could not our American empire at some time unravel just as unexpectedly? Those around me, in a once posh but by then run-down Petrograd neighborhood, paid little attention to Gorbachev's long-winded speeches on state television. Some didn't care, others were oblivious. Most people were just too busy eking out a living. Yet in hindsight, the Empire's days were clearly numbered. A Civil War Outside My Door I looked through the smoky-colored windows of our communal apartment, toward St. Vladimir's Cathedral and its saffron-colored exterior. The Empire is unraveling, and below, there are signs of the creeping chaos. The scene around the cathedral is a source of practical information. Combatants converge around St. Vladimir's. On one side are the growing flocks of worshippers. On the other, the growing groups of drunks, whose numbers surge over the summer, proof that yet another Communist Party effort, spearheaded by Gorbachev himself, to battle Russians' love of the bottle is running dry. The image of drinking and of Russia may indeed be a Western stereotype. In fact, half the population imbibes little, if at all. Yet the drunks are there, right before my eyes. The drunks favor the area for a simple reason. Out of spite or ignorance, the city authorities opened a skid row beer stand, or pivnushka, which in the official hierarchy of the Leningrad Municipal Department of Public Eating Places is literally at the bottom of the barrel. Restaurants, cafes, and cafeterias rank higher, right next to St. Vladimir's, a cathedral sheltering one of Orthodoxy's most sacred icons. Announced with a sloppily painted sign reading Pivo, beer, the Pivnushka is just an open-air shack. There's no pretense here. The patrons, mostly bleary-eyed men who've seen better days, line up to get smashed, quickly and cheaply. Warm, brackish-tasting tap beer is poured into scratched-up mugs and passed into trembling hands. By noon, drunken men are all around the beer stand. They spill into the street around St. Vladimir's and into its courtyard. They pass out on benches. They wave their drinking glasses. They spit. They shout. Then the skirmishes commence. The pious, most of them women, scatter the drunks away from St. Vladimir's with raised hands, swinging purses. Many might be described as babushkas, but babushka is another Western caricature. A balloon-cheeked granny in a multicolored scarf. These women are of all descriptions. Gaunt, urban matrons with bird-like arms, college girls, wobbly, roly-poly peasant mothers, some of them with their grandchildren in tow to teach them to know their icons. This is new and daring. Two years previously, such catechism exposed oneself to the prying eyes of potentially informer priests. The saints usually win these daily conflagrations. With sweat popping off their foreheads, the sinners retreat to their rear base down Talalakina Lane near the Pivnushka. And in reality, both sides are winners, are they not? For both, freedom has indeed been found. For the saints who now worship in public without looking over their shoulders, and for the drunks who indeed would have been rounded up as parasites or miscreants just a few years back, 
They stand around, drinking and laughing and shouting in animated if inebriated conversation, oblivious to the robed priests and head-scarved women entering St. Vladimir's Cathedral, ironically in this year of 1989, the 200th anniversary of its consecration. Yet to others, that freedom, the Empire's demise, is a symbol of the impending anarchy, unpredictable and threatening. A few steps separate St. Vladimir's Cathedral from our building's entrance at Talalakina Lane 79. Nina Nikolaevna and I pass through the entranceway, she making a deliberate attempt to ignore the loitering drunks. We slowly ascend to the fifth and final floor of the dark, winding staircase, stopping on almost every landing. Her legs are riddled with gout, victims of the World War II Nazi blockade of the city which killed nearly a million Leningraders and barely spared Nina's life. Our corner of the communal is the first room on the right. Privacy is a piece of cloth hung over a rope drawn across the middle. Nina Nikolaevna's bed occupies a sacred corner. The sheet of fabric serving as room divider is almost never pulled all the way back. I sleep on a small, hard divan near the door. There is a black and white television set, a small table, a bookshelf. The tablecloth is pristine, the floor swept and scrubbed to a gloss. This is the inner sanctum, away from the shabby, common areas in the hallway, toilet, and kitchen. A ubiquitous people's radio is bolted to the wall, obligatory in any Soviet flat. It offers no choice of frequencies, just buttons to push for three government radio stations. Interspersed with music, announcers read ominous-sounding Communist Party bulletins. The ring through the tinny speakers consists of stern warnings to the leaders of independence from the Baltic republics of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, who are already well on their way to seceding from the USSR. Nina Nikolaevna is sturdily built, with a wisp of grayish-white hair and warm but steely eyes that hint of a long, hard life. She makes the trip up and down the deep stairway several times a day on those gimpy legs. She might, one could presume, because of the exile of her daughter or the hyperinflation devouring her pension, have less reason to defend the system than many other people, but that is not the case. Nina is no Stalinist, not even a party member. Yet to her, imagining the demise of the empire is like imagining the sun won't come up tomorrow. She turns to the subject of the seceding Baltic republics, the first major crack in the empire. The Balts are all full of empty talk, she waves her hand dismissively. What's done has been done. In other words, the Baltic states will always be part of the Soyuz, Soviet Union, because they became a part of it by whatever means and were thus stuck being part of it for eternity, like it or not. Even at this terminal stage of the empire's existence, food stores emptier by the day and decent shoes scarce, Nina Nikolaevna is convinced that the Soyuz will survive. I am a blockade Nista, says Nina Nikolaevna weightily. Her eyes glow in an extinguished sparkle, as if the phrase needs no elaboration. The experience of surviving the 900-day Nazi blockade defines the city's spirit and makes any hardship a trifle by comparison. The siege is the most tragic in the city's history, and I think it was then that the name Leningrad was finally adopted by the inhabitants who survived, wrote the celebrated poet Joseph Brodsky in his essay Guide to a Renamed City, 1979. He was about three years old when it began. Nina Nikolaevna was 16 when the siege started on September 8, 1941, the date the Wehrmacht completely encircled the city. She was untold decades older when it was finally lifted on January 27, 1944, with the Nazis starting their retreat that would end with Hitler's suicide in his Führer bunker on April 30, 1945. But that was later. That was victory. Back in the autumn of 1941, then the spring of 1942, then the autumn of that year, and then all of 1943 into early 1944, Defeat loomed over the city as it was pounded by German artillery and aircraft. It was not the sound of the bombs, but the silence on the streets in between the bombardments that was the most frightening thing, Nina Nikolaevna says. Fuel had run out. What little remained was requisitioned by the army. No fuel meant no vehicles moving about, just the occasional sound of boots still healthy enough to hit the pavement. Early on, the authorities began rationing food, canned goods from state stores, and then anything grown in garden plots, cabbage, onions, and carrots mainly. When domesticated animals such as cows and sheep ran out, butchers turned to horses to make sausage, and then to cats, dogs, and rats. There was one case, they wrote about it in the newspaper, 
where a man came to his relatives and saw that their dog was still alive, even if just a bag of bones, Nina Nikolaevna recalls. They had already talked about the dog, about the fact he would have to be eaten. Then when the man came to the apartment, the dog compliantly walked up to him as if completely cognizant of his final duty, to be someone's dinner. Starvation finally arrived, and bodies piled up on the streets. Rumors abounded about human meat being hacked from the cadavers and hawked at the main bazaar. Eventually, they cut our rations to stale bread, she related. Then a slice, then half a slice, soon half a slice of flour mixed with sawdust, and then sawdust mixed with crumbs and water. Nina Nikolaevna's mother was a Leningrad Museum curator, Evgenia Timofeyevna Smirnova. She and other curators were given the sacred task of hurriedly collecting masses of priceless art, icons, artifacts, and even imperial heirlooms, including Empress Catherine II's dresses, for museums and Tsarist summer residences. They were often subject to Nazi bombing runs. It was dangerous yet heroic work. Nazi troops were already within the outskirts of the city, where most of the former Tsarist estates were located. The last time Mama went to the outskirts of the city to collect more heirlooms, she heard voices speaking in German, Nina explains. Several of the palaces were later captured by the Nazis and destroyed before the art gatherers got there. The Nazis shipped their contents to Germany before torching them. Once collected, the icons and artwork had to be stored in places relatively safe from Nazi bombings. One was the massive St. Isaac's Cathedral in the city center, an edifice cut from incredibly thick granite and possessing a deep basement, rendering it practically bombproof. This gave the three, Grandmother Daria Avinovna, her daughter and heirloom rescuer Evgenia Timofeyevna, and the young Nina Nikolaevna, the privilege to dwell in that cathedral basement, safe at least from Nazi bombings, but not safe from starvation. And so amid the collection of priceless luxuries and national heirlooms, the young Nina Nikolaevna withered away. She lay on a cot in the basement of St. Isaac's, too weak and hungry to walk as the sawdust bread rations grew smaller. So Nina Nikolaevna lay away on her cot starving amid the empire's riches. Now she was within days or at most a couple of weeks of death. But then there appeared the miraculous gift of sustenance from nowhere, or rather from the Leningrad Zoo. After all the other animals had long been devoured, there remained two once playful seals. That they would ultimately be slaughtered was not in doubt. There was no food or fish left to feed them. The dilemma was not this, but rather whom the seals would save with their ultimate sacrifice. Who would be the chosen ones, those to receive precious bits of fat-rich seal blubber? How would this momentous decision be taken? After all, it was a zero-sum question. That couldn't be denied. A lucky few would be selected. The seal blubber might bring them back from death's doorstep. Certainly there were scores, no hundreds, of others whose lives would not be spared by the ultimate choice. A family friend knew one of the zookeepers, a hunk of the seal blubber would be Nina's, the difference between life and death. More than 45 years after the end of the blockade, Nina describes the sensation fully, as if the taste of seal blubber is returning to her parched lips and tongue. She describes how a man, a family acquaintance, slipped into the basement of St. Isaac's Cathedral and handed a chunk of seal fat to her mother, who gently placed it in Nina's mouth. Nina chewed the fatty seal blubber slowly in that basement room stuffed with icons, washing it down with a bit of sawdust bread and rainwater, waiting for the magic effect to set in, drug-like, until the next day the swelling in her legs began to ease. She gradually got up and stood on her own two feet again. The Leningrad blockade may be a miracle of survival for some, but tales of surviving it are rarely paraded about. Even today the subject is spoken of in whispers and serious conversations. Images of it are so harrowing that they are usually absent even in the bravado of Soviet World War II films. Along the city's main Nevsky Prospect, I noticed a plaque or two dedicated to the victims, and there are monuments here and there, but far fewer than one would expect of such a brutal experience. Nina's survival story is so gruesome, the knowledge that hundreds of other Leningraders were not the lucky ones saved by the magical slaughtered zoo seals, that she reveals the details reluctantly. She confesses that she has never even told her own daughter, the exile Mila, the full story of the seals, a fact Mila later confirms to me. Buildings leveled by artillery shells, carpet bombings, and whole districts engulfed in an inferno of flames, 
These are physical inflictions triumphantly rebuilt in defiance and victory. But the famine left no visible destruction. Perhaps that explains the reticence of survivors like Nina. A city being rebuilt after a pummeling to the ground is heady with a sense of renewal. Workers scurrying about, repairing bomb holes and collapsed walls. A sense of having prevailed. Yet it's harder to know how to impart triumph into honoring a dead man, his hands out in his last moments or mouth open, taking in those breaths as he slowly starves to death, even a man whose country was eventually miraculously victorious. Perhaps that is why Nina insists that the Soviet Union will survive, for she has survived. The country won the Great Patriotic War, World War II. She has endured the privations, the exile of her dissident daughter, and despite a respectable career as a lawyer, she is confined to her crumbling communal. How can the Soviet Empire not survive? Our communal. The communal is a place where perfect strangers are forced into an uneasy common existence, where even all whispers are audible. These total strangers inhabit a perpetually cramped virtual elevator, every imaginable slice of Soviet society tossed together. Teetotaling gold toothed engineers from Central Asia across the hall from beer guzzling Siberians. Bespectacled spinsters with icons hidden under their beds, treated to the nightly arias of the rail station whore next door. Notions of personal property blurred beyond recognition. Everyone borrows everything from everyone else, from sugar to socks, from tram tickets to tea. Everyone, from former royalty to former black earth serfs, obliged to spit their words through the same brown stained telephone receiver line up outside the one toilet for all, and wait for someone else to replace the burnt-out light bulbs in the foyer. They, or rather we, all lived in communal apartments, four or more people in one room, often with three generations all together, sleeping in shifts, drinking like sharks, brawling with each other or with neighbors in the communal kitchen or in the morning line before the communal john, beating their women with a moribund determination, crying openly when Stalin dropped dead, or at the movies and cursing with such frequency that a normal word like airplane would strike a passerby as something elaborately obscene, wrote Brodsky in 1976. There is a solitary doorbell, as the apartment was once the property of some baron and his family. Now, the once stately spread is divided into five individual rooms. There's a makeshift system to keep up with the socialist reality, with each of the five rooms in our communal having its set designated number of bell rings. For Nina Nikolaevna, it's two turns of the old bell. It resembles the gentle I'm-behind-you warning bell on the handlebar of children's bikes that you ring with your thumb. Caution is advised in ringing the communal bell, because if you ratchet the dial a touch too fast, a third or fourth ring is emitted, rousing an annoyed neighbor who mistakenly thinks the ring is for him. But don't be too gentle, for if you stop at one ring, an equally perplexed resident is produced, thinking he is the subject of the summons. There is a single telephone in the hallway placed next to a bench. Our number is 233-4832. Only two cities in the USSR of 1989 have seven-digit numbers, Leningrad and Moscow. The elite seven-digit designation is a source of pride. As for using the phone, the cardinal rule is that no one is allowed to monopolize it for more than a few minutes at a time. That's usually not a problem. Where the problem arises is that there are two Nina Nikolaevnas in our communal. My host, Nina Nikolaevna Slatina, and the widow Nina, whom I will henceforth refer to only as the widow, across the hall, some 25 years younger, and whose patronomic is also Nikolaevna. Some callers use the surname of the Nina Nikolaevna they want to converse with to ease the confusion, but not all. Cases of calling the wrong Nina Nikolaevna to the phone can be humorous during the day, but seldom at night or toward dawn. In addition to the five one-room apartments that make up our communal, There are also common areas. If residents do not really own their apartments, then no one owns the common areas, which in reality means that no one has any motivation to take care of them. Down the hallway, for example, is the communal toilet. To get there, you must negotiate your way by the dim glow of a single dust-encrusted orb. The wallpaper is stained and falling away in places. The floorboards have been sopped with dozens of coats of paint over the decades, dark reds and greens mostly that have been chipped and gouged and worn into grooves by the contact of a million heels. There is one toilet for everyone, with no permanent seat. Rather, each room or family possesses its own personal wooden perch. Five of the wooden contraptions adorn the wall of the WC, hanging on long nails driven into the wall. Once I used the wrong seat, 
Worse, I left it on the toilet rather than hanging it back up on the wall. I won't describe the scandal that ensued. Suffice it to say that if a long incarceration were a legal remedy for this crime, the offended would have demanded its swift application. There is a large, dark kitchen with two ancient cast-iron gas stoves. Twinning them are two loudly snoring 30-year-old refrigerators. Cooking is done in shifts, first come, first served. A constant smell of reused lard, potatoes, and onions, the mainstay of my diet during that summer of 89, wafts about, some of the few groceries possible to procure without waiting in long lines. The Petrogradskaya Starona, the Petrograd side, our district, is one of Leningrad's most beautiful, and that's no easy feat. We live in sight of the glassy Neva River, on one of the 101 islands that the city and its endless run of neoclassical facades are built upon. Reflected every second by thousands of square feet of running silver amalgam, it's as if the city were constantly being filmed by the river. No wonder that sometimes this city gives the impression of an utter egoist preoccupied solely with its own appearance, wrote Brodsky in Guide to a Renamed City. The erstwhile imperial city smells of faded elegance and expropriated fortunes, a result of its status as a former haunt of the Tsarist Empire's wealthiest citizens. Some own ten-room spreads on two floors, replete with servants' quarters, dwarfing my imaginary baron's five-room spread on the fifth floor across from St. Vladimir's. Then came the February 1917 overthrow of the Romanovs, followed by the Bolshevik Revolution of November that same year, and everything changed. With Russia facing a massive housing shortage after World War I, the Bolsheviks summarily relieved many previous owners of everything save a single room in their own mansions. Paper-thin walls, often only sheets or canvas strung from ceiling mold, slashed grand dining rooms of classic dimensions into weirdly shaped and cramped living shafts of two or three and even four units, now home to refugees and indigents. The Communist Party ideologists concocted theories about the communal as a quintessentially socialist concept. Consolidation, the intentional commingling of former class enemies, served to break down social barriers. In reality, the communal was a strictly utilitarian invention. You could pack more people into a small space if you gave it the right kind of name. My communal neighbors, in addition to Nina Nikolaevna, include her husband, Igor. He is so quiet and overshadowed by her forceful presence as to be virtually invisible, and thus easy to forget. Is he a failure? Does he regard himself as one? With the entire Soviet system stacked up against anyone trying to get ahead, the Communist Party elite nomenclatura accepted, of course, and forced to live like laboratory rats in tiny ferris wheel cages, it is little wonder so many men turn to drink and women to religion. What would I do if this were really my life? Other neighbors include a young man nicknamed the Colonel, who occasionally mutters from behind his door about very dark things. I repeatedly turn down joining some dreamy scheme he rattles on about, smuggling rare Alexandrite gemstones out of the USSR, getting us both filthy rich. There is also a quiet older man down the hall, another drinker, who rarely emerges, and an owlish old woman and her middle-aged son, who live next to the bathroom and tend to avoid me, the whispered reason being that a close relative works at a secret munitions factory. Finally, there is the widow. She's about forty, with a head of long black curly hair. The widow exudes a frantic air of unrealized eroticism. She has two puberty-aged sons. They take turns stomping in the hallway, ravenously laughing and explaining that they are playing hide-and-seek with hamsters living under the floorboards usually when I want to sleep. The widow spends hours helping me practice my Russian late into the night and often, after her boys are asleep in the same room, tells me about every problem she has or is likely to have in the future. It seems that she thinks that I might be a part of the solution of relieving her of some of that burden, or banishing it altogether. Each of the neighbors befriends me in their own way. Even the folks with kin working at the munitions factory come around. One takes me to the traditional Russian banya, or bathhouse, across the street, where I receive my first beating with birch branches to open my pores to sweat and sweat and sweat. The grime-covered shower in our communal is not for the faint-hearted. In stark contrast to, or perhaps because of, the decrepitude of the communal hallway, toilet, and kitchen, Nina Nikolaevna's room is fastidiously clean. She is always on guard against anyone entering without the little slippers known as tapochki that are de rigueur in a Russian household. No matter how ill-fitting, no matter how tattered, they must be worn. Eschewing them is tantamount to shaking hands with someone over the threshold of a doorway, a deadly omen that most Russians avoid by ripping their hands away if a foreigner makes the mistake of proffering his. Nina sometimes laments the state of our building and the selection of goods available in the stores, which is dwindling by the day. 
Somehow the subject of Stalin comes up, responsible for as many Soviet deaths during his 30-year reign as the number who died in the Great Patriotic War fighting Hitler. Yes, people were executed under Stalin, Nina Nikolaevna says gravely but matter-of-factly, but average folks were not generally harmed. Mostly, they repressed people connected to power in some way. She says this as if political engagement is itself a type of guilt, and that innocence can only be found in passive acquiescence to authority. Yes, admits Nina, the empire is capable of punishment, vindictiveness, and revenge. But you have to remember that we lived rather well under Stalin, she adds. There was food on the table. He won the war over the Nazis. We survived the blockade. A long pause. And then... Our people need a bit of an iron hand, says Nina Nikolaevna, obliquely referring to the gathering chaos in the disintegrating empire, from the drunks down the street to the imploding planned economy. I will hear the same thing from the other ordinary Russians for years to come. In Nina's own eyes, the empire is also responsible for great feats. For her, the empire itself was the mysterious hand that put that precious piece of seal blubber to her lips during the starvation of the Leningrad blockade, giving her a second lease on life. Tears of a KGB Man Nina Nikolaevna's crash course in the ways of the communal was reaching an end. I nodded knowingly at her entreaties about whom to avoid, the colonel for one, and who to turn to in need of help, the widow. I had passed the communal home economics section as well. In addition to having learned to use the right wooden toilet seat, I could now distinguish between our grease-coated fry pan and the almost identical others, and I no longer used someone else's towels. One skill was pretending to lock the door with an ancient key. It looked like something pilfered from the antiquities section of the Hermitage Museum. The locking ritual was an act of willing self-deception. Locked or not, the door often flung open when given a good shove. Satisfied with my progress, Nina Nikolaevna announced that the time had come for me to fend for myself. She and Igor had for many summers retired to a bucolic dhaka outside Leningrad, and the time to return to some facsimile of their Russian peasant roots was at hand. In reality, the dhaka was a bare-bones rented room with no plumbing, but at least it was in the countryside. She pulled a few tattered suitcases from under her bed, and I watched her gather a few blouses and a dress and fold them inside. Igor added a pair of old pants and a shirt and some socks, and a whole summer's laundry was ready to go. A second contraption, a duffel bag on a metal frame with vinyl wheels, represented the portable kitchen and was stocked with rice, sugar, and other staples hard to get outside the city. There were a couple of plates and bowls, and a tarnished silverware set. Igor tossed in a few packs of acrid, unfiltered cigarettes. Like a dutiful son, I helped them carry the luggage downstairs into an overcrowded trolley bus that stopped in front of St. Vladimir's Cathedral. The trolley bus was sweltering hot and packed to the transoms with bleary-eyed men fresh from knocking them back at the beer stand. Nina Nikolaevna pretended not to notice them. We deboarded at Finland Station, where Lenin made his triumphant return to Russia in 1917 disguised as a locomotive worker, an event marked by an enormous statue of Vladimir Ilyich standing atop an armored vehicle that dominated the station yard. After the purchase of two tickets on the rickety, if reliable, electric suburban trains, we walked in the shadow of the statue among the human hustle and bustle of the platform, the bittersweet smell of burning locomotive engine oil staining the air with a sense of impending departure, while Nina Nikolaevna issued last-minute edicts about the rule of law in the communal. No drunks inside, especially the colonel. Understood. Always lock the door, and if it doesn't work, don't leave until it's fixed. Yes, ma'am. And never, ever, leave or go to sleep with the television on. Never. This was an oath not to incinerate the communal in her absence, Soviet televisions were known to overheat and explode if the power cord was left in the wall. Nina Nikolaevna and her Igor ascended the steps to their carriage, and she continued to issue last-minute directives while holding her cane like a scepter. Her pose vaguely resembled the nearly bronze statue of a triumphant Lenin thrusting his arm into the sky, and I almost felt that I was vowing to join the vanguard of the 1917 revolution against Denikin's whites and other class enemies of the great socialist experiment. But it was 1989, and the only vigilance I was being drafted into was to be on guard against diabolical saboteur appliances and counter-revolutionary drunks. I promised that I would try. Then the electric train silently pulled out of the station, and I was alone in Leningrad. Or almost alone. Before leaving the United States, my Russian teacher, Victor, and Nina Nikolaevna's exiled daughter, Mila, had given me some addresses of friends left behind in Leningrad. One was Leona Shaknazarova, 
an ethnic Armenian woman who had recently fled the Azerbaijani capital of Baku. Anti-Armenian riots had erupted there in one of the first spasms of inter-ethnic unrest that would soon almost engulf the empire. There were whispers of dark forces being behind the violence. Leona was staying in a room on the first floor of a building near Bolshoi Prospect, a 15-minute walk from our communal. Her first-hand experience of the ethnic supernova expanding across the empire informed her view of its future. She was convinced that there was none. Leona was well-educated and from an intelligentsia family and was thus connected to the upper echelons of the Communist Party. But if she ever had any sympathy for the disintegrating system, it had turned to antipathy. Over the thimble-like cups of Turkish coffee, Leona hinted darkly about KGB practices, and that I should watch out. I chalked it up to paranoia. This was, after all, the era of Mikhail Gorbachev's declared glasnost e perestroika that were supposed to represent a sort of Soviet sunshine clause on society. All the paranoid cloak and dagger stuff of the Cold War past was banished forever. Be careful, she reiterated. I know how they work. I asked her to explain. Your apartment, for example, she said flatly, referring to the communal. I was all ears as Leona pointed out that only recently had foreign visitors been allowed to stay in private apartments. Until then, guests such as me from the non-socialist world had been confined to hotels or dorms. And as for gaining permission to stay in a communal like ours, especially one linked to forcibly exiled dissidents like Nina Nikolaevna's daughter Mila and her husband Victor, well, it was simply unheard of. Indeed, the local visa office had initially told Nina Nikolaevna that I could not stay with her. Then, inexplicably, they changed their minds. You see, said Lorna darkly, winning a point. Why then, I asked, did they issue me a visa at all? Because they probably thought it would be more interesting if you did come than if you didn't, she said, giving the third-person pronoun an odd twist of ominous emphasis. They probably want to find out what you're up to. What I'm up to? Yes, the purpose of your visit. To work on my Russian, of course. Yes, Leona smiled, of course. All foreigners were required to register with the local registration office, known as the Otto Viz e Registrazi, or Department of Visas and Registration, referred to by all by its acronym OVIR. Call it an oversight, call it foolishness, call it an exuberant forgetfulness, call it deliberately courting doom, which it was not. But the fact remained that I was vaguely aware that I should have checked in with the OVIR authorities the day after my arrival, and I had not. To assist me in talking my way out of trouble, the widow offered to accompany me to the OVIR, and I gladly accepted. The walk to the OVIR led along the picturesque bank of the Neva River near the Peter and Paul Fortress, where notables from Dostoevsky to Tito had spent time locked up, and skirted the Gorky metro station and a small amusement park, as well as an iconic old ice cream cafe. It was a pleasure to be outside on that cloudless day, walking with the widow. At OVIR, I joined an orderly line of Russians waiting to obtain permission to travel abroad. The authorities widely started to allow this about a year earlier, as part of the gradual opening of the system. When my turn came, I handed my passport and visa to a clerk who, after a quick glance at the data, told me to wait. Then she disappeared down a hallway and into an office, re-emerging a couple of minutes later and beckoning me to enter. The widow followed, whispering that she was acting as my translator, although she spoke not a word of English. Behind a grey metallic bureaucratic desk sat a grey metallic-looking medieval bureaucrat, or chinovnik, who looked up at me with a grey metallic look of shock and horror straight from central casting. This is very serious, growled the bureaucrat, pushing his body away from the desk. You are two days late for your registration, according to the Soviet law governing foreign residents in the USSR. His name was Comrade Shemyakin, and his face was so severely centered by smallpox or some other useful disease that it looked like a kilo of frozen hamburger after a hatchet attack. A taciturn bureaucrat right out of Gogol, a live literary archetype almost too good to be true. There will be a penalty, announced Shemyakin, and you are obliged to leave your passport here while we determine the proper sanctions. The widow swooned and pleaded with Shemyakin in rapid-fire Russian, indicating that the situation was grave, very grave. Narodzi, implored the widow. Oh my. But Scarface Shemyakin only shook his head in the negative. We exited the OVIR office in despondent haze. For my part, I was kicking myself for having dropped the ball on the well-known registration business and saw my late Soviet adventure going up in smoke. Or more accurately, going up in the air on a 12-hour flight back to the United States with a persona non grata stamp in my passport. 
We need to bring him a present, hissed the teary-eyed widow. You know, an Amerikansky putterock. An American present. Palm greasers, she meant. A bribe. We practically sprinted back to the communal and up the stairs to the fifth floor and the other Nina Nikolaevna abode, where I tore through my bags for some potentially appropriate gift, settling on a couple of packs of Marlboros and a $20 bill. Then we headed back to the OVIR. We jumped the line of Soviet citizens trying to get out of the country that I wanted to stay in and made a dash to Shemyakin's door before the secretary could stop us. Once inside, the widow Nina unceremoniously plopped two packages of Marlboro Reds on Shemyakin's desk along with the $20 bill. What is this? Shemyakin sneered dismissively, in a tone that conveyed neither acceptance nor rejection of the paltry hall. It's not about that, he snarled, referring to the gifts. I'll call you once we get everything figured out. Now get out of here. Notably, he did not shove the gifts back across the desk before we cleared the door. It was a long night spent fretting and worrying with a good amount of self-recrimination and anger mixed with despair. I couldn't sleep until toward daylight and woke to the grating sound of the communal telephone in the hallway ringing off the hook. I tried to ignore it, thereby saving myself the trouble of trying to decipher which Nina Nikolaevna the caller wanted, my absent landlady or the widow who had retired in a fit of distress at my apparent fate. Let someone else answer, I said to myself, covering my ears with a pillow. But no one seemed to be around. Finally, I forced myself to my feet, headed into the hallway and snatched the receiver in irritation, demanding who the caller was and with which Nina Nikolaevna he wished to speak. I immediately recognized his voice. It was Shemyakin. But instead of declaring the persona non grata with the 12 hours to leave the USSR, he almost beamed friendship through the receiver and it was rather clear that our newfound camaraderie was not due to two packs of smokes and twenty bucks. Could you come to the OVIR office at 1800 hours, 6 p.m., he asked politely. Of course I will, I replied. Glasnost and Perestroika had apparently won the day. Heading to Shemyakin's office alone that evening, it occurred to me that the timing of our rendezvous was unusual. All Soviet offices strictly observed priyam, or reception times, typically between 10 to 12 in the morning and 2 to 4 in the afternoon. Before, between, or after those hours, the bureaucratic state was in lockdown. 6 p.m. thus seemed like a very odd rendezvous time. My confusion deepened when I got to the OVIR. The main entrance was locked and there was no one outside. I rang a bell. A well-dressed secretary popped her head out. She invited me inside, a little too warmly, and sat me down in the reception area. Then she and another pretty bureaucrat hurriedly packed their purses and rushed out the door as if late for their own weddings. A few more moments passed in silence, and then I heard a distant door open and shut and the pitter-patter of footfalls approaching. Lavrince, said the voice in Russian. It was Shemyakin, wearing a smile so forced that it seemed to cause him pain. He moved uneasily, stiffly, like a rusted robot, as he led me down the hall and into a comfortable room with leather sofas. There was also a coffee table carefully laid out with coveted Misha the Intoed Bear chocolates from the Red October factory, sundry cookies imported from abroad, beluga caviar in a crystal bowl, and a bottle of Ararat export cognac from Soviet Armenia. Shemyakin motioned to me to sit down, sat down himself, and handed me my passport and visa with a smile. Everything's fine with your documents, he cooed, as if being two days in major violation of the Soviet foreign registration law had been a joke. Spasibo, I said, standing. Thanks. But before you go, there is someone who wants to meet you. The American image of Soviet KGB officers was reinforced by dozens of late communist period B films made by, of course, Americans. Usually, the pristine Yankee is snapped off the streets of the USSR and flung into the gulag as if it's just a sport. The physical appearance of the KGB man was a constant as well. KGB men were almost invariably portrayed as sadistic, shabbily dressed, and paranoid, and as projecting zero humanity, whether feigned or otherwise. In reality, most Russians knew the M.O. of the Czechist, especially middle and higher ranking ones, to have been different, at least in the post-Stalin era, when there was less bloodletting. A solid career in the KGB was among the most prestigious Soviet occupations, like it or not. An athletic-looking man of about fifty years of age entered the room and strode toward me with a hand outstretched to clasp mine. He was gracious, almost glib, and introduced himself as Valerie, though I have no idea if that was his real name. He acted like a stage actor emoting at a theater in the Park Summer Fest, where he had to belt out every consonant and vowel. He wore a black leather jacket of high quality, a stereotypical KGB getup. 
Tack! exclaimed my new friend, uncorking the bottle of export cognac and pouring us two shots. Scarface Shemyakin hovered in the background, timidly following along with the ritual. The first toast was to my arrival in the USSR. The second was a throwaway about the Druzba Narodov, a standard trope about the supposed friendship among nations of the USSR, or in this case between the USSR and the USA. After some more chit-chat about the need for international understanding and other gracious goo, Valerie poured a third toast and dedicated it to our work. This seemed odd, but I downed it anyway and was preparing to make my own when Valerie put down his rumyochka, or shot glass, and looked straight into my eyes. So, he asked without a hint of a blink in his steely eyes, but with a face still glowingly warm and smiling, who sent you? Sent me? Yes, he grinned. What is the purpose of your visit? I must have looked dumb. I didn't know what Valerie was talking about and said so. I have no purpose, I responded using the Russian, Yumenya net seli, and sounding far too existential. Valerie rolled his eyes slightly, and Shemyakin's pasted-on grin started to fade. I mean, I've come to improve my Russian, to see friends. And why is it you've chosen to study Russian? I'd heard this question dozens of times from Americans as often as Russians. Many Russians assume there was something innately dubious and possibly nefarious about foreigners wanting to learn the language of Pushkin. Many Americans, by contrast, automatically assume students of Russian to be commie sympathizers or wannabe spies for the CIA, thus reinforcing the Soviet assumption. But Russian is a beautiful language, I said. But there are many beautiful languages, countered Valerie. What about Italian? What about French or German? Then for some reason Lenin popped into my head, specifically a flashback from the monument at Finland station, where I had seen off Nina Nikolaevna. But look at Lenin, he knew so many languages, I said. Valery rolled his eyes again and poured us another cognac. Yes, languages are important, he reflected. But tell me, he said after a slight pause. It might be quite uncomfortable for you to live in that communal apartment. I mean, to my knowledge, Americans aren't used to such conditions. I replied that I found the experience interesting and that, at any rate, I had no money for anything more luxurious. I was a student, in other words. I had saved up for the airfare while working as a waiter and also studying at university and was not paying a cent to stay at Nina Nikolaevna's, unless you consider rent the two tins of hard-to-find cinnamon and some other simple gifts brought from the United States. Food and other staples in 1989 Leningrad were dirt cheap by Western standards. In other words, I could probably live more economically in the USSR including airfare for a summer doing nothing than working and renting a flat in the States doing a summer job. Perhaps we could help you, smiled Valerie. I mean, it is very expensive to visit the USSR. Perhaps next summer you could work with us. You could even work here, in the OVIR office. I stammered something incoherent, wanting to disbelieve what was happening. Valerie the KGB man, who insinuated that I was on some deep cover mission posing as an indigent American student without their brains to register his residency on time, was now trying to recruit me as a double agent mole, implausible as it was. Or at least he believed I was valuable enough to recruit as a KGB mole, though I could offer nothing in the way of information or contacts. I was dressed in sneakers and had no job and not much money. I was living in a run-down communal and not out of some hippie let's-all-be-poor wish. I had no connections, no ties to any government, real or imagined. The whole scene was too ridiculous to be true. I pinched myself, hoping it was just the cognac gone in my head. It wasn't. I was being interviewed by a suave Soviet state security man who, after befuddling my brain, was now getting down to the real point. Tell us about the exiles, Valerie gently prodded. You know, the daughter and son-in-law of the woman you're staying with. Who? Ah, you know, exclaimed Valerie with a smile. Victor and Mila, your teachers in the United States. How are they? What do they say about the Soviet Union these days? I could not deny that I knew them. It was Mila who had arranged for me to stay in her mother's communal room. They recall with pleasure their days in the Soviet Union, I blurted, sounding ridiculous even to myself. The sentence was as clumsily bookish as it was absurd. Eight years ago after being exiled, Victor only mentioned communist in tandem with expletives. Really? With pleasure? said Valerie with a knowing smile, while twisting his shot glass slowly with his fingertips. This is odd, because as you must know, their departure from here was rather... bitter. Bitter? The self-destructive dissident Victor had to be practically pried out of the empire because he refused to leave the same place that many other dissidents were desperate to get out of. 
One day in 1981, Victor and Mila were summoned to the same OVIR office where a lady clerk handed them a stack of forms. Your poor auntie in Israel is sick. Of course you need to go help your poor auntie in Israel, said the clerk. We are going to arrange exit visas for you both at once. Victor shook his head in the negative. We don't have any relatives in Israel. He laughed at the incredulous clerk, who acted like she was speaking to a man turning down a winning lottery jackpot. You're the first ones to laugh about this, remarked the clerk. Just fill out the paperwork and get it back to us by tomorrow, she insisted, shoving the forms at Victor. Once they arrived back at the communal, Victor realized that he didn't even have the name of his non-existent Israeli auntie. He had the gall to ring the clerk up on the telephone. Davushka, young lady, what's the name of our Israeli auntie, he asked. Are you screwing around, fool, came the clerk's response. Well, maybe we won't be going to Israel after all, answered Victor laconically. Um, just bring the damn documents yourselves. We'll take care of your aunt's name ourselves, came the clerk's irritated reply. For what seemed like an eternity, I pretended to be fascinated with staring at a nondescript office clock mounted on a wall. Well, I said at last, breaking the silence about Victor and Mila's present attitudes about the USSR. Last we spoke, they said they were really excited about Gorbachev's glasnost and perestroika reforms, I told the KGB man. This was either a pathetic faux pas or my saving grace, because few words uttered by Americans evoked more nausea from KGB-type Russians. Our naive smiles and adoration of Gorbachev, a man at best grudgingly tolerated by most Russians at the time, evoked a sensation similar to the regurgitation of curdled milk among many of them. It wasn't that they were against reform, but Gorbachev's communist-style vernacular led many to doubt his sincerity. Glasnost and perestroika, yes, Valerie said, still smiling but barely able to contain himself. Interesting, of course. Tell me, is there anything else that Americans can discuss about Russia other than glasnost and perestroika? I did not need to answer but tried to make a rational assessment of my situation and found it wanting, pathetic. Fact. I was drinking cognac and eating caviar after business hours with a KGB man who wanted information about my Russian teachers in exile, Victor and Mila. Both were acid-tongued critics of the Soviet regime. Before his exile, Victor was so reckless in his denunciations of the party that some of his closest friends thought that he might have even been KGB himself, acting as an agent provocateur. He had been a contributor to a well-known underground Samizdat publication, Tritstat Sem, 37, or Tritstat Semitov, meaning 30 Semites, as the KGB sneeringly referred to it. Mila, meanwhile, was in with a dissident women's group and trade union activists, which the KGB was particularly nervous about in light of the solidarity events in Poland. Even eight years after their departure, when communism, if not the empire itself, was clearly collapsing, the KGB man was still following them. Valerie had personally handled their expulsion from the Soviet Union in 1981, a fact Victor confirmed when I described Valerie to him. Possibly there had been some internal squabble over whether a labor camp or exile fit their crimes. Perhaps Valerie had come down on the losing side of the argument and was still bitter. Who knew? Second stupid fact, I had dredged up the already worn-out glasnost and perestroika theme. Even ordinary Russians were often disgusted by Americans' naivete, assuming that reforming the USSR would be a painless matter of injecting a little democracy. It must have been especially galling for a KGB type like Valerie to have to listen to twaddle coming from a toothy smile of a silly American who in his estimation didn't understand a thing about the consequences of an imploding empire. Last and most embarrassing fact, I had failed to react to Valerie's recruitment offer if indeed the offer made to a clueless American kid in battered sneakers who was living in a communal associated with unspeakable dissidents had been made in earnest at all. Another uncomfortable pause descended on us, which was finally broken by Valerie. Tell me, my young American friend, he asked rhetorically, do you know what it is to spend your entire life building a house just to watch a gang of vandals come and try to tear it down? I listened to his bitter soliloquy. Let us presume that the house wasn't a perfect house. Some of the beams were weak. Many mistakes were made in building this house. A fool designed the fireplace. It fills the room with smoke sometimes. A relative got electrocuted rigging up the electricity. But gradually we learn. Yes, the house is not perfect. It leans to one side. But we live in this house, you see. 
It is our house. I said nothing. Nothing needed to be said. Is it better to let the vandals tear it down with a bulldozer and kill all the inhabitants? Or is it better to move some of the bricks gradually, fix the beams one by one, rebuild the fireplace while keeping a kettle of soup on a little stove nearby? Valerie's voice trailed off, and his glibness took on a paler hue. His eyes remained fixed and steely, but his lips turned up at a slightly weaker angle. The tears of a KGB man. A bigamist bandit and a button maker. Leading a life of crime isn't easy, Vova laughed slightly at his self-evaluation. It was part justification and part plea for sympathy. We were just emerging from a brief and thankfully bloodless altercation with two men on a small bridge near the Kirov Theater. They had been walking toward us and slowed as Vova and I approached. It was just after dusk on a foggy evening. The combination of darkness and mist produced a disorienting effect, reducing real visibility to a few yards. Vova and the two men recognized each other's faces with difficulty. Once they did, all three pranced like nervous cats circling for a scrap. There was a long pause while menacing glances were exchanged, followed by a string of profanities uttered in quick, quiet succession. One of the men spit forcefully into the ground and muttered something to the other. Then the pair swaggered on into the gloom, as if they'd just benevolently granted us a stay of execution. Da, whispered Vladimir, a.k.a. Vova. Disiotaki nelegko vestizin, prestupnosti. Living a life of crime really isn't easy, but it beats being a slave. This was, in a way, the mantra of the Vorvi Zakon, or at least the modified version of the thief in law at Credo that dominated the late Soviet criminal underground. Volvo was my guide in trying to discover what it really meant. We met in 1987 during my first visit to the USSR as a student at Leningrad State University. Volvo was then officially working as a factory laborer in a clothing button factory, but with the Soviet economy already teetering, He'd taken to supplementing his wages by becoming a private entrepreneur, a capitalist, which was an economic crime against the state. At first it was harmless if still illegal stuff, such as buying name-brand wristwatches from tourists along Nevsky Prospect and then hawking them to fellow Soviets for a markup. That was the story of our first encounter. My roommate Jared was walking along Nevsky Prospect when a lanky, loud, gregarious kid with a big head of frizzy hair going off in all directions as if he used lye for a hair conditioner, approached and tried, in broken German, to buy Jared's Timex. Spasibo, Jared had curtly replied when offered a week's worth of prorated ruble wages for the timepiece. Thanks, but no thanks. The offer was then doubled, but Jared still turned it down. Jared explained he wasn't interested in selling his wristwatch. Over the semester, we would often run into Nova on Nevsky Prospect, and we gradually became acquaintances. When he wasn't using his gutter German to score watches from surprise Swiss tourists, Vova gave us impromptu tours of what passed for Leningrad's underground hippie scene, and in between shifts at the clothing button factory, aptly named the Button Factory, where he worked, he took us on expeditions to little-known former czarist castles and even organized shish-kebab cookouts in the Russian woods for his two new American friends. Petty street black marketers like Vova were reviled as slime by many Russians of the time, Yet while some of my Russian intelligentsia friends ended up having ulterior motives in pursuing my friendship, Vova never asked me for a dime or even a small favor. A couple of years later, Soviet society began its critical meltdown. Words like racket, racket, as in criminal, killer, killer, and mafia singed themselves into the vernacular. In fact, many Leningraders seemed to take a dark Dostoevsky in pride in playing up their city's apocalyptic atmosphere even if its outward reputation as being one big mafia operation was exaggerated. Most ordinary people were not personally affected by the growing mob. At least Volvo wasn't, because he had become a part of it. On this particular day, we had agreed to meet at the Petrogradsky metro stop. As usual, Volvo was a few minutes late. I didn't mind. Petrogradsky had always been one of my favorite metro stations. The entrance had extremely heavy metal doors that were impossible to push or pull fully open. I couldn't understand if this was a deliberate design defect to save on hinge repairs or some sort of sadistic ploy. One had to sort of prop the door open and squeeze through before releasing it, and the door would often swing violently backwards and lash the next poor soul in line in the face. Across the street from the station, there was a store selling posters emblazoned with Soviet-style propaganda exhortations. 
I remembered it as two years earlier having been full of classic communist anti-American bombast, such as a lithograph of a U.S. missile with a picture of Ronald Reagan's head in the form of an atomic warhead. But Glasnost and Perestroika had taken their artistic toll during the ensuing years, and most of the more hilarious, rabidly anti-Western pictorial rants had been replaced by posters promoting sobriety, advocating ecological consciousness, or, even more surprising, preaching touchy-feely peacenik stuff. As I gazed into the shop window, I saw a shadow growing larger in the glass. I turned around without recognizing the man in the glass. It wasn't until he flashed his fossilized smile that I knew it was Vova. He'd shaved his head, revealing nicks, cuts, and divots around the perimeter of his tightly wrapped skull. His hands were stuffed into the pockets of an oversized, creme-colored trench coat. He looked menacing. We exchanged a hug. I asked some requisite questions about his family and work, including the button factory. Vova screwed up his face. I don't work at the button factory, he snarled, waving his hand as if to swat away a mosquito. I've got a new job now. Then he flashed a grin so wide that the brown rot between his gums shone like shiny bits of rust. Let's go, said Vova, grabbing me by the arm and leading me toward the street. We stopped a Lotto 1, a Soviet knockoff of an early 1970s Fiat, and climbed in. Kupchino, Vova told the driver, the name of a grimy expanse of factories and faceless apartment blocks in the south of the city. Why aren't we taking the metro, I asked. It's faster and cheaper. The metro? What for? countered Vova, as if the notion of a subway were suddenly beneath his dignity. Cappuccino, he told the driver again. Then he turned and spoke to me in a conspiratorial whisper, just loud enough for the taxi driver to hear. You see, I've got a new system, hissed Vova. I just wait until the driver approaches a red light where there's a lot of traffic. I tell him to get in the left lane. So? I ask. Then, when the traffic starts to move, I jump out, slam the door, and run away, snickered Vova. The taxi driver is stuck. He can't get out and chase me with cars behind him. If he does, his car might get ripped off. He can't get over into the right lane either, because it's blocked with moving traffic. By then, I'm long gone. I saw the driver jerk his neck slightly as Vova explained his fare policy for cabbies. Maybe the driver thought it was just a joke from a shaven-headed thug in a trench coat. We sped south over the elegant iron drawbridges across the Neva River. We had a perfect view of both banks, clad in granite block. The Baroque and neoclassical buildings, without a space between them and none higher than the Winter Palace, seemed bathed in a kaleidoscope of fading pastels. Against the setting sun I could see St. Isaac's Cathedral. Half the city seemed to be in scaffolding, a Soviet hallmark. As we passed south across Nevsky Prospect, we began moving away from the city's heart and into areas dominated by the stolid structures associated with Stalin-era buildings, and then finally into the outskirts of the city, where the functional buildings of the Khrushchev era reigned supreme. While most were only 20 or 30 years old, the suburbs of the future were already crumbling, battered, cookie-cutter identical high-rises. This was Cappuccino, a formerly pristine, if swampy, forested area that was now a socialist-style ghetto of battered buildings, state-run factory behemoths, and gangland turf battles. It was a world away from my communal and Nina Nikolaevna's Petrograd district of cathedrals, czarist haunts, and long avenues of worn-down but warm coffee shops. Cappuccino's miles of apartment blocks were of such a uniform design as to be virtually indistinguishable from one another. The streets were laid out in a rectangular monotone. Humidity discolored the sides of the prefab buildings, leaving black soot-like lines that adorned the exteriors in abstract maps. This proved to be a godsend, for the soot murals made it possible to tell one identical building from another. Otherwise, it was easy to get lost in the Orwellian maze, possibly the work of a dissident urban planner bent on architectural sabotage. It reminded me of the crumbling housing projects in the south side of Chicago. Cappuccino may have had its aesthetic shortcomings, but from a sociological perspective, it was a hotbed of life as the Soviet Empire was collapsing. Among the endless stretches of crumbling residential blocks buzzed a beehive of fledgling extortionists and shady businessmen. They hung out in acrid smoke-filled billiard clubs and slimy disco bars. All around were smoke-belching, state-owned factories waiting to be taken over in sham privatization schemes. Our old Lada rattled to a halt in front of a nondescript storefront. When Vova asked how much we owed for the ride, the driver shrugged. This was unusual, since Soviet gypsy cab drivers, like cabbies everywhere, had a habit of overcharging anyone stupid enough not to negotiate the price beforehand. 
Oh, it's up to you guys, said the driver, faking a smile. Vova handed him a wad of rubles as we got out of the car. The driver didn't bother to count them and looked relieved as we disembarked, as if he dumped off a pair of lepers. There was a long queue in front of the store. People were grumbling. Some were arguing. At first I thought the line was for the vodka or milk, but there was no drunks hanging around and no one was coming out with bags of groceries. Two tough-looking men greeted Vova. One was short and skinny. He had on acid-washed jeans and a shiny, synthetic-looking leather jacket. The other was taller and balding. He wore a tracksuit. Under the top half, he wore a sweater. Vova and the men discussed something and we moved on toward the shop. The two men led us to the front of the line. I thought we'd evoke hostility for cutting in front, but no one uttered a word, or even gave us a dirty look. A man in a slightly too tight sport jacket and tie propped open the door and let us in. The number of customers was tightly controlled. There weren't more than a dozen inside. Several times more waited in line on the street. An overly deferential manager-like man was there to meet Vova and his two business associates. All four of them then shuffled away to a back room. Vova smiled and gestured that I should wait where I was standing and maybe take a look around. I did so, then realized with a jolt that we were in a state-run jewelry store. There were gold bands and neck chains, rings with small diamonds and other items made from precious metals and stones. Customers were huddled over the display cases. Most seemed less concerned with the aesthetics of the goods than with the practical qualities, such as grams and carrots. One squat, middle-aged man with thick pharmacy-style glasses purchased some sapphire earrings and two gaudy women's rings with completely different band sizes. I wondered whether he was making a foray into cross-dressing or just had a lot of paramours to please. It wasn't that everyone had struck it rich and had started buying up baubles in the midst of an economic collapse. Prices for gold and stones had been set artificially low by the state, much lower than on world markets. Buying and then reselling to middlemen could be lucrative, like swapping a $10 bill for a 20 The shoppers would then go on to sell to other middlemen or take the loot out to western countries and hawk the items for hard currency. Vova and his lot were middlemen too, after a fashion. They controlled access to the store, taking payoffs from the people in line who anteed up for prime positions and rights to buy from special collections of goods. The gang then shared the payoffs with the store managers, the managers then used the proceeds to secure more jewels and gold from state suppliers, and so on. And Vova's guys also provided insurance, as he put it. The insurance bit was obligatory, obviously. Yet the gig wasn't a raquette in the full sense of the word. Vova scolded me for misunderstanding the difference. A racket, he explained, was a simple, one-off extortion with the extorters threatening to kill or maim the owners of a budding small business cooperative, or actually killing or maiming them, unless they handed over cash on demand. Vova was adamant that this sort of crude shakedown had no resemblance whatsoever to his respectable line of business. His vocation had important sorts of moral underpinnings, as Vova reasoned, because he and his associates provided actual protection for their clients, who might otherwise be molested by real racketeers, or worse, by corrupt Soviet police or bureaucrats, who could either extort money themselves or simply shut down the operation. And no one wanted that, did they? Vova acted as if he were the only thing standing between the workers of the jewelry shop and chaos. We keep an eye on them so they don't get kicked around, he said. You see, the people we protect would rather deal with us than the cops. Why? With the cops, they might have to pay bribes, or they might end up tossed into the clink for no real reason. The cops can end up running the store, or the cops and some bureaucrat might close it down. So the workers prefer to deal with us. It helped that everyone was part of the racket. The state suppliers who dealt the cut-rate goods for bribes, the store managers who took and gave payoffs, even the customers who bought purely for speculative profit, and of course, Vova and his business partners. They were the most parasitic on the food chain, but the fact that everyone in the entire game was corrupt helped calm his conscience. Bardock, Vova exclaimed, once we were back in another taxi heading away from the jewelry store. Whorehouse. This was Vova's one-word postulate about the nature of crumbling Soviet systems and usually signaled the beginning of one of his out-of-the-blue inexplicable rants. The word Bardock can literally mean whorehouse in Russian, but colloquially, it is something closer to chaos or mess. It lacks the vulgarity connoted in English, and in the language of Pushkin, it is employed with great frequency. Still, I could not get over the curiousness of hearing whorehouse several times a day from the lips of average Russians whenever the slightest injustice befell them.
In Volva's case, it sounded more like an explanation of the untenable social order that demanded his racketeering activities than a justification of the same. My father is a fucking communist, Volva began. He still believes in that nonsense, or at least he thinks he believes in it. I tell him he's a fool. The simple truth is that this is anarchy, and anarchy doesn't respect fools. We drove on. Volva became silent. I said nothing. It started raining. The monochrome landscape blurred. We were now deep in the heart of Cappuccino. Volva piped up, noting we were near the button factory he'd quit. And it was for those who continued to toil there that Volva reserved his most potent venom. Whorehouse, Volva sputtered, shaking his head. This time the word served not only as an empty exclamation. A bunch of fucking whores, that's what they are. Mentally ill people. I just can't understand why those workers keep degrading themselves. They are slaves. What's more, they enslave themselves to rottenness. And what is the only thing worse than a slave? A slave unwilling to liberate himself. He willingly submits to a state of enchainment. He works blindly in the name of a monstrous force. Here Vova's monologue turned from gutter-level Russian I was used to from him into a literary bloom of rich verbs. But the point was pretty simple. In a world of scoundrels and baseness, it is better to be evil and free than decent but enchained. Volva suggested we stop off to see Pavel, a mutual friend and fellow watch hawker I'd met during the good old days of making barbecue in the Leningrad forest. Pavel also lived in Kapchino. The pair had met at the button factory, where Pavel still worked the night shift, a fact that Volva ridiculed. We turned onto Budapest Street and got out of the taxi, paid the fare, and entered another cookie-cutter building. We climbed several flights of stairs. The elevator was out. The hallway smelled of sweet and sour garbage and urine. I slipped on what felt like some vomit on the floor and barely avoided tumbling head over heels down the stairs. We reached an upper floor and knocked on a door. A woman clad in a bathrobe with a faded purple flower print, Pavel's wife's feta, opened the door cautiously and then began to smile. Vova, beaming, she eagerly invited us inside. She led us into a tiny kitchen where we found Pavel eating a bowl of noodle soup. Pavel embraced us warmly and we took a seat. Sveta sat down and resumed the activity she had been pursuing when we interrupted her, twisting bits of cotton into small, compact pads. I asked her what she was making. She looked at me as if I were an idiot. Through an elliptical description, she explained that the rectangular cotton cutouts were in fact makeshift feminine sanitary pads. Tampons were in short supply. Pavel's mother-in-law walked in, a stout matriarch with a military bearing. She smiled and put her arms around me. Then she glared at Vova and grunted a hello. It was obvious the two were not on good terms. How are things, Vova? What are you up to these days? She asked. Oh, you know, just business, came the terse reply. The room became eerily quiet, save for the duet of Sveta's ripping her fluffs of cotton into sanitary pads and Pavel's soup spoon making regular contact with the bottom of the porcelain bowl. Tenseness overtook the air. Vova quickly made up an excuse about having affairs to attend to. Since we hadn't seen each other in a long time, Pavel convinced me to stay for a while. We saw Vova off and he promised to call me soon. Pavel was smallish, cautious, and quiet to the point of being meek. With no higher education, he nonetheless exuded a professor's aura. Perhaps he would have become one had he not done a short prison stint. A few years back, a friend had smashed a store window and stolen a pack of audio cassette tapes. Pavel had known about the theft. He hadn't taken part but was prosecuted under a Soviet statute making it a crime for not reporting the information to the police. That slip-up, along with another friend's confinement in a psychiatric hospital for trying to emigrate from the USSR, had deepened his cynicism and caution. The Soviet breakdown was forcing Pavel and Volva to make major forced choices about their respective life paths. Volva obviously felt he had little to lose joining the expanding racketeering underworld. Pavel's situation was different. He had an infant son, who made his father more concerned with staying out of trouble than grinding axes over the affairs of state. Volva had tried to convince Pavel to join in his racketeering operation, but Pavel had refused, and things hadn't been quite the same between them since. Pavel admitted the work at the button factory was grueling, monotonous, and poorly paid. The monthly 300-ruble salary was once considered decent, but inflation had eaten into it. It's enough to buy bread and cottage cheese for my son, basic things, he said. Of course, I'd like to do something else. I know Volva thinks that I'm degrading myself by working at the button factory. But what Volva is doing is really dangerous. I don't need any more trouble. Volva and I met a few days later, this time on Vasilyevsky Island, connected to the rest of the city by bridges and the subway. 
Wilvis said he had a surprise for me, and we hopped into a taxi. How many times have you read Master and Margarita? Volva asked. I replied that I'd read the Bulgakov classic tale of good and evil once. Only once? Do you know how many times I've read that book? Seventeen fucking times, said Volva. He started to ramble on about the master, a writer who together with his mistress Margarita makes a pact with Satan. In an antithetical slap to Stalinist orthodoxy, the devil then visits Moscow, wreaking havoc in an effort to prove the existence of hell. Vova digressed into a half-coherent speech about the essence of good and evil and how, in Vova's estimation, the two concepts can be flipped upside down. Given his choice of conversation, I thought perhaps that Vova was taking me to some new alternative production of Master and Margarita. But when the taxi pulled up to our destination, I knew it could not be so. Although the building resembled a cinema or theater, the folks gathered outside did not look like the average literati crowd waiting for a weekday matinee. Rather, the sidewalk was crowded with men in black leather jackets waiting impatiently to get inside while circling one another like famished wolves. Most fit the same general description as Vova's thug partners at the jewelry shop. Vova thrust two tickets into a window, and we entered a dank hallway. A concession stand sold slices of white bread with lumps of fatty sausage, chocolate bars, and bottles of champagne and vodka. Volva ordered us two cups of black tea and some biscuits. I rarely saw him drink alcohol. Surly ushers then opened the door to the main hall, and a fetid odor of stale sweat flowed out while the crowd of several hundred men began pushing to get in. Kickbox, smiled Volva, ushering me to a squeaky red vinyl chair in the front of a boxing mat and ring. Kickboxing. I'd heard of the sport in the United States, but in Volva's world, the combination of martial arts and gratuitous violence was on a meteoric rise. There were several warm-up bouts that served as a sort of school for savagery for me, with Volva helpfully noting the finer points of the art form. Wild applause erupted when it was announced the main fight would soon get underway. A loud gong sounded, and two fighters got onto the mat and began warming up with a series of hand thrusts and foot jabs into the air. One was an ethnic Kyrgyz from Central Asia, whose name elicited some applause but mainly a chorus of whistles and derisive shouts. Then his opponent was introduced, and to a thundering applause. An ethnic Russian, he was clearly the hometown favorite. I still didn't understand much about the rules, but as far as I could tell, one wasn't supposed to kick one's opponent in the genitals. It happened repeatedly, eliciting a collective groan of agony mixed with approval from the throng. The Kyrgyz was at a disadvantage with the crowd. Whenever he landed a good shot, you could hear Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz echo through the hall in hushed tones, as if it were surprising and scandalous. But when the Russian landed his blows, cheers rang out. Two truths occurred to me as I watched the gladiators in action. The first was that ethnic and geographic designations, whether Russian, Tartar, or Chechen, played an important role in Leningrad's pecking order of organized crime groups. The second was that this was manifest in sports, too. Tough, physically fit former athletes were some of the first to start protection rackets when capitalism crept into the crumbling USSR. Martial arts enthusiasts made good enforcers. Satisfied with this new knowledge, I grew bored with the contest and spent much of the time checking out some of the mugs in attendance for this cutting-edge Leningrad spectator sport. Then, with a fast fist-kick combo delivered by the Russian to his opponent's head and ribs, the Kyrgyz collapsed into a heap and it was all over. The Kyrgyz got in some good shots, though, muttered Vova, giving credit where it was due as we left the fetid arena. We headed back away from Vasilyevsky Island toward Nevsky Prospect, where Vova said we were to meet someone at the Saigon Cafe, an alternative haunt at the other end of Nevsky Prospect and several kilometers away. For some reason, Vova set us off walking while he seamlessly returned to the life lessons to be gleaned from Bulgakov's Master and Margarita. In his estimation, the author had succeeded in portraying the Soviet Union as Satan personified, a world where evil had become good and good evil. Don't you see the part played by the devil? Vova seemed to be living inside the book, tormented by the value inversions that had become his existence. Indeed, his life had in effect become a form of rebellion against the dying Soviet system which he so railed against and yet was so much a part of. For Vova, morality no longer existed. Perhaps from a distant perspective, this sort of relativistic thinking is easy to condemn, but in a collapsing society whose rulers are quickly being rewritten, it becomes more comprehensible. Was it admirable to toil in a button factory where the workers were being ripped off by hyperinflation, corrupt asset-stripping managers, and predatory bureaucrats? Was it moral to be one of the managers or state officials? 
Was it less moral to run a protection service or be a corrupt cop hitting businesses for shakedowns? The twilight of the Soviet Empire reflected into a crooked mirror where the dark shaded into light, heaven was a sham, and hell was visible all around. Volva didn't stop his literary exegesis until we reached the Saigon Café. I'd been there once before but had forgotten how ill-matched the name was to the place. One naturally assumed to find a Vietnamese theme, however marginal, in food or decor. However, the Saigon was a run-of-the-mill Soviet-style cafeteria where the patrons stood up because there weren't many chairs. Volva again ordered tea. No sooner were we sipping from banged-up plastic cups than an old woman hobbled in and accosted us. She was wearing a dirty overcoat and eyeglasses held together at the nose with transparent adhesive tape. She snickered loudly, mumbling something incomprehensible. The woman pointed with one hand at Volva, leaning on a cane with the other. He did his best to ignore her. I tried to make out what she was saying. I think she wants twenty kopecks, I told Vova, about a nickel at the time. Vova by this time was rattled by the bag lady's taunts, which she for no discernible reason aimed solely at him and not a single other patron. Granny, do you want twenty kopecks? Vova asked her, gritting together what remained of his teeth. The street lady, deranged but with lucid eyes, seethed, launching into a tirade against Vova. No, I don't want your twenty kopecks, she hissed. She rambled and waved her finger at him, mocking his facial expression. The old woman maintained this enraged state for several minutes. Eventually she ambled back out into Nevsky Prospect. The episode spooked Volva. He'd just been talking non-stop about Master and Margarita, which for Volva served to soothe the contradictions of his guilt-ridden criminal life. To him, the unhinged bag lady was an apparition dispatched to expose his sins. Volva soon relaxed, however a beautiful specimen of the emerging genetic strain of soon-to-be post-Soviet womanhood, with light auburn hair that came down to her waist and warm, knowledgeable eyes, emerged, covering his eyes from behind. She was stuffed into an above-market skirt and expensive shoes. I didn't have to ask who was paying the tailor. Guess who? she cooed. Volva smiled and pretended not to know who it was. Her name was Ellie, and she was a 19-year-old student from the local economics institute. She had come to Leningrad from Kingisep, a town on the Estonian border about a hundred miles to the west. I learned all this as she took each one of us by the arm, Russian style, and marched us out of the cafe, turning toward the landmark Kazan Cathedral before arriving in front of a much smarter looking establishment that met the full restaurant classification, rather than the cafe class that the Saigon fit into or the low-rung beer stand across from my communal at St. Vladimir's. It was obvious Volvo was not there for the first time. The waiters slouched around in dark cotton vests, Scattered as we entered the dining room, obviously in no hurry to come into contact with him, Volva and Ellie sat down across from me. She summoned one of the food servers and ordered a bottle of still cheap Soviet champagne, along with some baked mushrooms julienne with cheese, a Russian specialty, and some tough meat of an indiscernible variety. Ellie spoke as if defending a philosophy dissertation. She began ruminating about the sorry state of the empire. Each sentence was prefaced by the somewhat pretentious words, Predpolazim, let us assume, or dopostim, let us allow. They sounded appropriate on her lips, along with the metaphysical term she used while trying to divine the future in a country where the past was constantly being redefined. Let us allow for the fact that Russia may completely cease to exist, she began. You mean the Soviet Union? I interjected. No, I mean Russia, Ellie continued. I mean we have to be prepared for the fact that it may simply cease to exist. Through the Armageddon-tinged pessimism that reigned as the Soviet Empire crumbled, Ellie's own mind was actually contemplating Russia literally sliding off the world map in a puff. Ellie imagined a great void taking over in the place where Russia was. Today, it is nearly impossible to understand the cataclysmic emptiness underlying this type of thinking, but in those days, it was not uncommon to hear from ordinary Russians. I asked her how she and Vova had met. Her eyes darted around the room, and she blushed slightly. Oh, we just met. Continuing with time-filling small talk, I asked her where she lived. At home, of course, with Vova, my husband. This seemed strange, as I distinctly remembered Vova saying that he was living with his wife, Lena, whom I had met many times. True, I hadn't seen her recently. Later, I would learn that there was a lot more to the story. Vova suggested going to his father's Dhaka outside Leningrad for an early summer outing. A couple of weeks later, on a Saturday, Vova and Ellie picked me up in a taxi, the day was unusually bright and warm for that time of year, and we headed out of the city in high spirits. 
We passed small villages where people from the city were tending their gardens in a get-back-to-the-land ritual as old as urbanization in Russia itself. Turning down a dusty road, we eventually pulled up to a nondescript but cozy-looking two-story wooden cottage and piled out of the taxi. Volva's father was outside, working the garden. He stood and silently scowled at us like interlopers to be barely tolerated. His facial expression gave away his thoughts. Here comes trouble, my criminal son and his unsanctioned foreigner in tow to visit me, a communist factory manager, here at my getaway Dhaka. What's next? Vova shed his shirt, revealing a sinewy physique dotted with tattoos. He got out a slab of meat he'd brought for the occasion and began chopping it into small pieces before putting the chunks into a metal canister, letting them marinate in vinegar and herbs. In the meanwhile, we were dispatched into a nearby wood to gather kindling for fire. Vova relished the feeling of being in control, entertaining his guests. He nursed the fire slowly until red-hot embers emerged. We stuffed ourselves with bread and pickles until Vova instructed us to start putting the meat onto skewers. He carefully turned to each over the hot coals, making sure the proper degree of cooking was attained. Then we sat down to eat at a picnic-like table, Vova's father grudgingly joining us, poking the shish kebab with his fork and chewing, a silence looming between father and son. Vova eyed a bowl full of sugar for making tea, and the conversation turned to the price. Riding out in the taxi, a woman on the especially conservative Mayak Lighthouse radio station had been literally weeping through the car's speaker over the alleged lack of sugar in the stores. Vova mocked her, and especially the radio station, which she accused of deliberately using old audio clips in an effort to discredit economic reforms. There's been plenty of sugar in the stores for at least two months now, Vova sneered. His father countered that perhaps there was sugar for sale, but that after the latest round of price increases, it was expensive. The price is fine, snapped Vova. But communists always want something for nothing, he said, referring to his father. Vova's father glared. So, Vladimir, when are you going to start working, he pointedly asked. Vova murmured something and Ellie giggled. We finished the meal in an awkward silence. I wondered what was going through the mind of Vova's father. The talk in Leningrad, some of it imagined and some of it real, was all about bandits, mafia, killers and the like. Yet it was as if people were talking about mysterious creatures existing only in speech and print. Bandits and killers, after all, had parents, families, some had children. I doubted that Vova's father, when asked what his son did for a living, answered, My son is a racketeer, or My son is mafia. I wondered if he thought about it at all. Whatever he thought, his drooping shoulders betrayed a deep disappointment with the road his son was on. After lunch, Vova's father went back to silently tending his garden, distracting his thoughts from the chagrin caused by his progeny while the rest of us lounged around. The sun approached its peak in the sky. The world was quiet. I watched Ellie tease Vova, sprinkling him with a garden hose. I wondered what exactly attracted her to him. I thought it must have to do with having a kind of status, or some promise of future wealth or maybe the hope of meeting someone connected to Vova who could provide both in greater measure than he could. One thing was evident, however. Ellie was clearly not in love. She was merely passing time. Despite all the crock imagery of endless suitcases full of dollar bills associated with the mafia, not everyone in racketeering-type activities was getting rich, including Vova. There was little romance to his profession. True, he always anteed up at restaurants and had enough cash to keep Ellie in nice threads, but he didn't even own a car, let alone one with a driver. Accordingly, our return to Leningrad was aboard one of the notoriously rickety, smoke-belching Ukrainian-made Lvov buses. It must have been manufactured not long after Stalin's death. We sat on the back bench, sprawled out, enjoying the rays of sun through the dirty window glass of the clunker. Back in central Leningrad, we took a short taxi ride to an old building near the Kirov Theater. We climbed up to the second floor of a decrepit corridor and turned right, it was another communal apartment. Vova, having forgotten his key, knocked on the door. On the other side, I could hear a lock turn. The door opened and there stood Lena, Vova's first wife. At this point, the mystery of what had happened to her became clear. They were still living together in the same communal, another pre-revolutionary rundown wreck. They had two of the five or six rooms, one where Lena slept and another next door for Vova and Ellie, wife number two, their headboard directly touching the wall against hers. Lena smiled at me and shrugged, describing the unorthodox situation without words. After a few minutes of awkwardness, we all sat down in Lena's room, a down-at-the-heels rectangle with enough room for a bed, a couple of chairs, and a nightstand covered with some cheap cosmetics and old magazines. 
Volvo opened some down-market Georgian wine with a flip-off plastic cap. For the first time, I watched him get drunk, and in front of his two wives, who seemed to be on good terms, more so in fact than with their husband. Volva drifted off into more banter about the rottenness of late Soviet life and his delusional, as he saw it, communist father. He started in again about Pavel and his degrading work at the button factory, getting up to dial the phone number, 1848488, only to be told by Pavel that he was leaving for the night shift at the button factory. Vova instantaneously suggested we go visit Pavel at the factory. The two wives, sensing a possible scandal abrew, wisely declined to join us, and we were quickly out the door. I'll show you a real Soviet factory and how those workers humiliate themselves, he snarled. We grabbed a taxi and within minutes were at the side door to the button factory. Vova knew the place well, having worked there previously. A night watchman recognized him. What the hell are you up to, he asked. This is an official excursion for our foreign delegation, me. Volva responded, lying. The watchman relented and we sprinted up a flight of stairs. I worried that Volvo was there to stir up some sort of scandal with Pavel in admonishment for his continued degrading manual labor. We ended up on an enormous factory floor where dozens of automated machines whirled away. Inside each were thousands of plastic buttons of all shapes and sizes, tumbling their way to a fine gloss. Pavel appeared in a work apron, dragging a huge, heavy bag of buttons behind him. He looked proud, not degraded. Then a small group of workers, men and women of all ages and description dressed in work overalls, latched onto us, each trying to outdo the other in terms of hospitality. Several recognized Vova, the camaraderie temporarily turning his despisal for the degradation of the Soviet factory into smiles. A foreman barked. He ordered one of the enormous tumblers, which sounded like little cement mixers, shut off, mentioning proudly that they were Italian-made. He opened a panel on one machine and told me to stick my hands inside, like a pirate's chest. I pulled open my palms to reveal dozens of multicolored buttons. Some had two holes, some three, some four. Some were orange, some white or red. I went home with my pockets filled with the loot. Then he showed us around the facility, including a rest area with several showers. A few emptied bottles of cheap Soviet sparkling wine adorned a table. It was obvious the work breaks included more than coffee. A middle-aged man and woman were just emerging with wet hair and wide grins pasted on their faces. We parted ways with Pavel, the foreman proudly pushing more souvenir buttons into my hands. Ellie and Lena were waiting for us when we returned to their communal. Volva again picked up his rant about the sorry state of the empire, reading jokes from a newspaper. Self-deprecating ones, expressing the misguided perception of the time of America as paradise. Volva read aloud, An American and a Russian are talking to each other. The American says, I have three cars, one I drive to work, the other I drive to my summer house, and the third I take with me when I go to Europe. The Russian says, to go to work I take the tram, I go to my summer house in a bus. And how do you get to Europe, asks the American. To go to Europe I ride a tank, says the Russian. After he caught his breath following another convulsion of cackling, Volva sighed and offered to take me downstairs and hail a taxi. It was late, almost 4 a.m., but Lena would have none of it. Why, Vova, it's so late. There's plenty of room here. My bed is big. He can sleep on the other side. Vova sized up Lena quizzically. Lena was warm-hearted, but I sensed an elaborate game of innuendo and revenge from her. Vova grumbled something and Lena pulled the door shut, with Vova and Ellie on one side of the wall, Lena and I on the other. As I lay on one side of the bed and Lena on the other, Paranoid thoughts crossed my mind of Volva's losing it in an act of uncontrollable rage or suspicion, bursting through the door to strangle both of us to death. Instead, I heard only what must have been a nightly ritual, a girlish voice from a Russian border town rejecting Volva's sexual advances. Next to me, Lena lay in silence, still awake and listening to it all, no doubt contemplating her unusual fate. The next morning, Volva was less than his cheerful self. Lena made no attempt to tease him or suggest anything improper had transpired, but he was circumspect with me. After a perfunctory tea for breakfast, we went downstairs to the street. Then Vova, the former button factory worker turned black marketer turned Leningrad mid-level mafia enforcer with two wives and an uncertain future, gave me a perfunctory polka, see you later. Vova did, however, accomplish one of his goals, liberating Pavel from himself. The day after our night visit to the button factory, the management summarily fired Pavel on the grounds that he'd shown a foreigner an industrial factory with potential military applications. Less than a year later, Pavel called me and said he had saved enough money to visit the United States, 
which he had always dreamed about. He asked if he could come to Chicago, where I was staying at the time, adding that he planned on being there for two or three weeks. Pavel's two to three week Windy City stay turned into two months, then two years, then twenty. He left his family behind, first working illegally at a junkyard owned by a Ukrainian slave driver owner. He soon moved up, landing a gig as a busboy. Pavel developed a cocaine habit, was robbed on the Chicago elevated train twice, married a Polish immigrant, divorced her, became a roofer, moved to Florida, and found a second Polish wife. The last time I talked to Pavel, he had joined an evangelical church and told me I'd end up doing the same someday once I found God. As for Vladimir, Vova, I never saw him again. About a year later, after arriving in what had re-become St. Petersburg, I headed over to the communal apartment where he and his wives lived. I ascended the stairwell and knocked on the door. A man pried it open just enough for me to see inside. He didn't have to ask who I was looking for. They're all gone, he said with a sigh of relief, shutting the door quickly. I made some phone calls trying to find Lena or Vova through a network of acquaintances, their numbers scribbled on a slip of paper. No one knew where they had gone. As for Ellie, I had no idea where to look for her. I rang Vova's parents' telephone number. His sister answered the phone. She recognized my voice and accent, but there was silence on the other end when I asked for Vova. I asked again if he was there. No, came the belated reply. Do you know when he'll be back, I asked. No, was the response from an even longer, more awkward pause. Okay, do you know where I can get a hold of him? No, said the female voice. Then she hung up the phone. I wondered where to look, or if to, and whether a prison or a graveyard might be the best place to start. Sickle and hammered down, an empire's last hours. The date was Wednesday, December 25, 1991. It was Christmas Day in much of the world, but in Orthodox Russia, just another day. Except it would turn out to be the USSR's last. I had come to Moscow two months earlier with the thoughts of pursuing foreign correspondence. I grabbed a cab and headed out in search of some groceries. Under Brezhnev, there was even cocoa in the stores, goddammit, the taxi driver slapped his hand on the wheel of his Volga four-door. Even fucking cocoa, he laughed uncontrollably through his gold teeth, as if the very idea of cocoa sitting on a store shelf evoked wonder. Look what they've done. Gorbachev and his cronies have destroyed a great country. Everyone feared us. Now I don't think even Upper Volta is afraid of Russia. Gorby had still hung on as one by one every last one of the 15 so-called titular republics that made up the USSR declared independence and sovereignty from the center outward. Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and when Russia declared itself free and independent of the Soyuz Union, Mikhail Gorbachev had effectively become a president without a country. But when his nemesis Boris Yeltsin, now president of the reborn Russian Federation, led the effort to cobble together a post-Soviet entity called the Commonwealth of Independent States, known by its clumsy-sounding acronym CIS, SNG in Russian, it was all over. Many Russians still had no firm idea as to whether the USSR, SSSR in Russian, still formally existed. The hammer and sickle flag was still flying, after all. Can you tell me what this SNG thing means, asked the gold-toothed taxi driver as I got out of his car. SSSR, USSR, sounded a hell of a lot better, he slammed the door behind me. While I scurried around town looking for supplies, Mikhail Gorbachev was spending his last day in power behind the massive red walls of the Kremlin. He'd been under a virtual news blackout about his fate, but not of the nefarious kind. None of the Soviet television networks was even documenting the last days of the empire because none of them seemed to care. By contrast, some foreign networks spent days in the corridors of fading power, recording everything now that the once-feared foreigners had easy access to the nerve center of the erstwhile evil empire. The irony was not lost on Gorbachev's closest aides. It is shameful for us that only Western TV journalists hovered around him, wrote Anatoly Chernyev in his account of Gorbachev's final days in power. While I was at the market Christmas shopping for bread and cheap sausage that morning, Gorbachev asked to have a telephone call arranged with U.S. President George Herbert Walker Bush, during which Gorbachev informed Bush that he would be making a special televised address at 7 p.m. Moscow time. He also told Bush that he had signed an order transferring control over the Soviet Union's nuclear briefcase, the means to launch Soviet nuclear missiles, to the Russian Federation and its president, Boris Yeltsin. As soon as I make my announcement, the orders will come into effect, he told Bush, so you can peacefully celebrate Christmas and sleep without worry tonight, Gorbachev added. 
Bush is said to have waxed emotional about the close personal ties they have developed over the years. It is not known if Bush offered Gorby asylum. Meanwhile, I had gone back to an apartment I shared with a friend, Sergei Lazaruk, who at the time was deputy dean of the prestigious Soviet Institute of Cinematography and trying to eke out a living on the equivalent of $100 a month. We had met earlier that year when I led a group of American film students to the USSR as their interpreter. A sundry group of other Russian friends had also come over to watch the TV broadcast with us, including Mikhail Zavillo, then a small-time currency speculator who used to change 50 bucks a time for me at the black market rate. Zavillo, well-dressed and soft-spoken, had just started work at Moscow's first commodities exchange. He talked about the unique economic opportunities amid the chaos and how the period would not be repeated in terms of its potential for making big profits. His optimism seemed absurd given the dire state of the Soviet-Russian economy. He suggested I join him and his business partners in the precious metals business. I declined and he openly laughed at my desire to pursue foreign correspondence. His laughter was well vindicated. Within years, Zavillo was running one of Russia's biggest aluminum plants. He made tens of millions before falling out with a regional kingpin governor and going into exile with his fortune. Meanwhile, I am still working a day job, whereas I doubt Zavillo feels much compunction to, beyond philanthropy. Sergei was the only one who seemed interested in watching Gorby and the passing of the Empire to be announced live on TV. Then the clock struck 7 p.m. and Gorbachev's familiar image filled the screen. He began to speak. Gorby expressed deep regret that it had proven impossible to save the Soviet Union. He opposed its dissolution. Upon assuming the mantle of power in 1985, he had had no alternative but to try to radically reform the system. It was clear not all was well with our country. I understood that to begin reforms of such a scale in a society like ours was extremely difficult and even dangerous. But even today, I'm convinced of the historic correctness of the democratic reforms that were begun in the spring of 1985. Gorbachev spoke for all of ten minutes, a historically short address. He concluded with the words, I wish you all the best. Then he was off the air, and the Soviet Empire, which had endured for 68 years, 11 months, and 25 days, was no more. And few seemed to immediately understand the significance of it all. Later, I learned a few more details about the aftermath. Immediately after his last address, Gorbachev turned to his final task, turning over the Soviet nuclear briefcase. Yet even this moment was tinged with absurdity. Boris Yeltsin, known for his tirades and unpredictability, had for unclear reasons taken offense at Gorbachev's resignation speech. According to Gorbachev, Yeltsin refused to show up in the Kremlin to take control of the nuclear button, as it is called in Russian. Gorbachev writes of the incident with bitterness. Yeltsin offered to meet on neutral ground. In the end, Gorbachev handed over the means to destroy the world many times over to Marshal Yevgeny Shaposhnikov and several senior military officers. Gorbachev went into a room with several aides who had stayed to the end. They poured themselves a round of whiskey, bitter solace for the USSR and its last leaders having already become an afterthought. Gorbachev recalls, There were no other procedures for seeing off the president of the USSR, as is the accepted norm in civilized countries. Although many years of close comradely relations connected me with most of them, not one of the presidents of the sovereign states, the former Soviet republics of the USSR, considered it necessary to come to Moscow in those final days, or even to call me. Within 45 minutes of his resignation speech, centuries lowered the proud red hammer and sickle from the Kremlin and replaced it with the Russian red, white, and blue tricolor. My friend Sergei Lazaruk, in despair, suggested we go to the center of Moscow for some drinks. In the street around Red Square, life went on as usual, oblivious to the empire's passing. People were strolling around, what few cafes that were open were packed, and one would not have known that 300 million people had just become citizens of different countries. But the quiet bordering on indifference about the demise of the common house that had been the USSR masked a churning fury beneath the surface. The genie of independence was out of the bottle, and the roller coaster ride of parading sovereignties and extreme nationalism had just begun. One of the first places to blow was at first glance one of the least likely, the wine and song filled and now former Soviet Republic of Georgia, which just happened to be Stalin's homeland. That's the end of part one of Eight Pieces of Empire by Lawrence Scott Sheets. I'm going to leave you all tonight with a Soviet song called Wondrous Future. Thank you for listening to the Workers' Reading Room. Good night, everyone.